Hi, I'm Craig Bridge, Head of Business at Kara Solutions. Thank you for joining me here today for Chatability, a platform for our community to engage in meaningful conversations about topics that are important to people living with disability. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land with which we are meeting here today, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And today I'm excited to explore the topic of caring for the carer. There are over 2.6 million unpaid carers across Australia, providing 2.2 billion hours of unpaid care every year. And Carers Australia estimate that there are over 250,000 young people across the country aged between 12 and 25 who are unpaid carers. And for today's episode of Chatability, we are here in the beautiful Darabin Arts Centre in Preston, Victoria. And I'm delighted to be joined by four wonderful panelists who will join me here today in discussing the various challenges faced by carers of all ages. I'd like to introduce our first panelist today, Jennifer Datto from Carers Victoria. Jennifer has been with the education and training team of Carers Victoria for over 15 years. During this time, she has been deeply involved in providing educational opportunities to improve carer health and well-being. Next, I'd like to introduce Christine Rawlinson, who is carer for her husband, Neil. Neil fell ill in 2017, resulting in him acquiring a brain injury, having both legs, all of his fingers and thumbs amputated. Christine is also the Carers Project Manager for Neighbourhood Houses Victoria. Next, we have her son, Sam Furs. Sam was only 11 years of age when he suddenly became a carer for his dad, Neil. Now 16, Sam has been an active carer for his father for over 15 years. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Nicholas Kalikia, team leader of the community engagement team at Mary Health Carer Services, which is part of Carer Gateway. Nicholas and his team work with young carers to support them to thrive in school and connect them with other young carers in the community. So Jennifer, starting with you, from your extensive experience, what do you feel is the real emotional impact of being a carer? Well, that's a good one to start with, Craig. Yeah. And I guess I want to preface that by saying that you've used the emotional impact as though there's one impact. Mm. But in my experience with working in care with carers, which I should say kind of roughly four categories we think of because you yeah. mentioned all ages. So yeah. let me just clarify who we mean when we say carer. Someone supporting uh, someone aged with particular needs someone supporting someone with a disability, someone supporting someone with a mental health condition, or someone supporting someone with a chronic illness, including palliative care. And the reason I mention those four categories yeah. within the context of the emotional impact is that we know that many carers are juggling people in more than one kind of category. And I hate to use the word category, but that's sort of how the funding yeah. falls. And the emotional impact I guess would best be described as emotional impacts. Yeah. And, you know, I could list 20 that carers across those four categories tell us about. I think in my work the biggest one is guilt. Mm -hmm. We can unpack what that means yeah. if you want to. Grief. So we're used to thinking about grief, most of us, I guess, in terms of bereavement grief, but I'm talking about grief in its own particular category of, of carer grief yeah. because wherever there's loss, there's grief. And when we talk about impacts, another group of feelings that I would say are the strong feelings and the panellists here will be able to check whether they think I'm right because mm. I'm, I'm quoting um, what I believe to be right, but yeah. it may not be relevant for you. And that is strong feelings around anger mm -hmm. or resentment um, because we know when the deeper feelings are stirred because we're talking about family relationships here, yeah. not just the positive emotions, but some of those more troublesome and challenging emotional emotions. Yeah. And they're the three biggies, I think, but carers always talk about their isolation and uh, their feeling of aloneness and uh, their feeling that they're out of the main discourse of, of society. Yeah. Because the thing is, is a carer isn't necessarily a job that you elect to do. It's mm. not something that you go for and you go, oh, time to move on in my career, I might move on to the next thing. It is a situation that you end up in um, and it's something that is, is um, put upon you with no length of tenure. Is that something that you experience, uh, I guess, in conversation as maybe one of those 
starting points of where those emotions start to come from. Yeah, really good point. No one ever woke up and said, I think I'll be a carer today. Yeah. So caring can suddenly come upon people, you know, an event that precipitates a whole life change or it can creep up on people. Mm. So I'm thinking of someone who may be supporting a parent or a partner with dementia where there's little changes yeah. but incrementally, step by step, things become tougher and harder and they start in the shallow end of the pool and suddenly they find they're in the deep end of the pool. Mm. So there are those. Uh, do carers have a choice? Well, sometimes. Yeah. But mostly the buck stops with the carer and uh, choice isn't always part of the equation. Yeah. And for our panel, um, having some deep lived experience with yourself, Chris and Sam, um, do these echo some of the thoughts and feelings that you experience yourself? Um, yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the grief is a huge one for me. Yeah. Um, I grieve the the life that I had planned to live um, mm. and Neil and I had planned to live together and I <clears> grieve the loss of the dad that the kids had grown up with, yeah. you know, for their 8 and 11 years respectively. And Sam has expressed that he feels like his dad died and mm -hmm. has been replaced by someone else. Um, and, and then we feel guilty about saying that sort of stuff. Yeah. But I suppose when we talk about anger, um, I'm actually angry at the system. Yeah. And I'm angry that people are making money out of our suffering mm. and that uh, the system is very much um, focused on targets and outputs and I feel that there is a whole system around you know, let's let's put however many carers through a program or however many people with a disability yeah. or whatever. I just feel that um, we're not actually, as a community, we're not we're not making a concerted, combined, collaborative approach to provide great outcomes for people. Yeah, it's all about the inputs and um, <clears throat> and I feel like there's a bit of victim blaming going on. Yeah. Yeah, and as certainly I think is a hot topic at the moment of um, there's a very distinctive gap between completing activities and ticking boxes and actually achieving outcomes because the activities fall behind if their outcomes are not there at the end. Yep. Another thing I was going to ask, Jennifer, is um, many people don't realise that there's a Carer Recognition Act and by not realising that it's there, they probably don't know that that much about its purpose uh, and what it, what are the principles uh, behind that. Would you be able to give mm. us a little bit of a rundown? So the beginnings of it were in uh, research which resulted in a number of acts, part of, um, I think the political word is raft of yeah. legislation uh, called Stronger, Fairer Australia. And because of the research that identifies some of the impacts on carers in their health and wellbeing, their financial well-being, their emotional well-being, they were seen to be a vulnerable group. Yeah. So in 2010, the federal government passed an act called the Federal uh, Carer Recognition Act. And then in 2012, the Victorian government and now all the states and territories have an act. And the aim of the act is to drive attitudinal change amongst those who are providing services where carers are involved. Yeah. So, for example, a mental health service needs to take into account the person at home who may be picking up pieces, disability services and so on. Acute medical services need to take into account before they discharge somebody with a condition, what is the capacity of the person at home? Let's not assume that they're just able to take on yes. the roles that may um, uh, they, that they may be called on to perform. So there is that, seeing the uh, well-being of the carer in relation to the person with the needs. Yeah. But the Carer Recognition Act is also to drive attitudinal change about the carer themselves. They mm -hmm. are a person in their own right, yeah. not just an adjunct to the person who has needs. They are entitled to their own sense of life and joy and purpose and uh, so the act is kind of two-pronged. Yeah. And it's great for carers to know because sometimes services 
can be a bit standoffish with carers or not mm -hmm. recognise them and say, oh, no, no, that's not uh, your business to know, when in fact it is the carer's business to know because they're at home long before the services arrive and probably Absolutely. long after the services leave. And you'll be able to tell me, uh, Chris and Sam, whether you think that I'm, I'm on the money there. So it is a good uh, line in the sand, I think, to have the Carer Recognition Act. Yeah. Nick, is there anything you picked up along the way here that um, you'd like to add in around this? Yeah, look, I think um, one of the things that I hear a lot is that word carer yeah. and what that actually means. Um, I think pre the Recognition Act, a lot of people used the term carer for a professional. Yes. So um, I used to be an NDI support worker and I was constantly called a person's carer and I would have to correct people because um, a carer is is what we define as somebody who's not not yeah. paid. So I think there are still a lot of people who don't um, actually connect to that word, and and that's completely okay. And I think we have to be you know quite respectful of that. Yeah. Um, I have heard a lot of carers say things like, "I'm I'm a partner. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a child. I I don't um, do this because." it's a role or something that I have fallen into, I do it because, you know, I feel it's an obligation or I feel, you yeah. know, there's lots of different reasons. And, and in that I take into account, um, you know, culturally, um, cultural reasons and, yeah. and culturally and linguistically diverse communities who might feel that sense of uh, responsibility mm -hmm. as well. And I think that's something that, that we take into to account. Um, I, I try to educate people around not, having to necessarily call themselves a carer if they don't yeah. want to um, doesn't mean that they have to actually relate to that. Um, that doesn't yeah. mean that they're not eligible for su supports um, even though they don't relate to that word. Yeah. Can I interject? One, Absolutely. one of the things yes. that I yeah. find, you know, everybody, you know, one of the first questions people ask you, um, what do you do? Or, you know, who are you? What do you do for a living? Yeah. And I've um, I've really struggled with that over the past five years. And now I say, do you want the short answer or the long answer? Yeah. Because I say that I'm a carer for my husband. Mm -hmm. So because I actually see that what I do to support Neil, I see that as very much a role on yeah. top of above and beyond me being his wife. Mm, yes. So um, I'm a carer for my husband, plus I'm a project manager, plus I'm a celebrant. They're, they're the different roles that I that play, play in my life yeah. as, you know, as jobs. Parents separate because that's, you know. <laughs> 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 and yeah. I think that, I mean, so that's weird. a good segue. Um, some of the questions that I have for yourself, Christine, um, and I know this will be emotional for all of us, but could you take us back to the day that Neil worked from his coma, um, you instantly, like that, you became a carer. Um, yeah. And what that, what that experience was like. Well, at the time that he he got sick and before he went into the, the three-week coma, he um, I had just gone back about uh, oh, eight months previous to that and into full-time work because I wanted to, to be part of the NDIS and I was the regional NDIS community educator. So when Neil was sick and, um, you know, for that whole time that he was in the coma, I was told every day why he was not going to survive that day mm. for the three weeks. So when he woke up, I was relieved. I was exhausted. Um, I laughed because he said some really ridiculous things like, you look like shit and um, <laughs> I think you're over-exaggerating and um, he had no idea what had happened for the past month. But I thought, you know what? this is something I can do because mm. I know the NDIS better than just about anyone I know. Um, I, I educate people about it. I, I know that I can do this for my husband and my family. I can get us everything we need because I have the inside knowledge. Yeah. So th that was something that it gave me comfort because yeah. I thought I'm actually um, in a position of power here. Yeah. Yep. So that's how I felt. Yeah. <laughs> then what happened? Then what happened? <laughs> yeah, that's the interesting part is the next um, step, right? Well, yeah. Um, then what happened was everything came crashing down really because nobody in the hospital knew about the NDIS mm -hmm. or uh, what it involved. I was giving um, presentations about the NDIS and eligibility and what was involved to the staff from Neil's, you know, from Neil's yeah. hospital room because they were desperate to know about it. But the, um, 
the federal government in all their wisdom hadn't decided to educate health professionals about mm. the NDIS. So, um, you know, I was running a bit of a campaign from, from the, the hospital bed. Um, we've, we're currently up to year, year five and a bit and I don't even know what number planner we're on to anymore. Yeah. I don't know. Um, people just churn we don't have a relationship with uh, planners anymore for Neil. Um, we've been on the national news two, two years after Neil came out of hospital because he still didn't have an accessible bathroom mm -hmm. and we still didn't have an accessible entrance to the front of the house. So the planner who was allocated to do the review wouldn't come to our house because it wasn't wheelchair accessible and she was a wheelchair user. <laughs> but they wouldn't fund us. Until for the ramp. So we were caught in this ridiculous twilight zone where I was just going, my God, I've landed on some weird parallel universe where nothing makes sense. We would get quotes for things from OTs, but by the time the quotes were looked at, mm. the quotes were out of date. So then you had to start all over again. And I just thought, I just cannot realise how such a well-funded system can mm. be so dumb. Yeah. <laughs> and I was, and this, <laughs> this is where I was getting just really frustrated. Yeah. And as a health professional, my background is as a speech pathologist, I'm thinking if an OT or a speechy or a physio who's qualified, who has a code of conduct, recommends a piece of equipment, why is it having to go through all of these other people's intros to then get approved? Yeah. Now, I know from my tra training in the NDIS, people have a typical support package and amount of funding that's attached um, that the actuaries have worked out is what the value of their NDIS package is. Yeah. If it comes within that funding allowance, just bloody approve it and get yeah. the man a ramp. You know? <laughs> but yeah. instead, we went through years of fighting and arguing and everything. So you can see why people become angry and yeah. the grief is high and you are made to feel like poor little Oliver, you know, asking for more when all you're asking is for the basic, the basic, mm. basic stuff to get by. Mm. We just wanted Neil to have a shower without our house flooding. Yeah. He needed to be able to get onto the toilet. Pretty major, minor things that we're asking for. And the work in that, that space, because I guess uh, where people's mind can go to easily as you're a carer, so you're doing particular activities supporting someone, um, you know, <clears throat> showering, doing these things. The fact of the, um, the business manager of the plan, the navigating of getting the plan to go from document to reality mm. is, a, is a, a massive task. And as you mentioned, um, I just come from the NDS CEO's conference and everybody in the room was talking about the fragmented challenges, the red tape, the fact that, um, I try and remember who it was, but I feel like it might have even been Bill Shorten who mentioned <clears throat> it was a little bit like Sydney where there's a bunch of highways, but none of them are interconnected with each other and you've got to work out how to navigate from one point to the next. Is Absolutely. that what your experience is Absolutely. like? Absolutely. And, you know, like in order for me to be here today, I had to get up before six o'clock, turn on the laptop, pay the invoices because I've got a real responsibility yeah. as somebody, as an unpaid carer, to make sure the people who are supporting my husband get paid. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I do each morning is pay NDIS invoices and then I'm, you know, doing some work tomorrow as a celebrant, so I thought I'd better get their wedding organised because that's pretty important. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> um, and then I showered Neil because we were told that he might be going into hospital today but we didn't know because we hadn't heard anything. So... We didn't know how he was going to get into the hospital, whether it was going to be while we were here. So I showered him, packed a bag, did all that, nagged someone to get out of bed, um, got another kid off to school and then realised I still hadn't had anything to eat or showered myself, so quickly did something about that. So I'm sorry if my lipstick's halfway up my face. But, um, oh, plus I did some work emails in between. And... Um, I'm exhausted and I'm obviously rambling because I'm exhausted, but I yeah. suppose what I'm saying is why am I working so hard? Yeah. <laughs> because um, other people in the industry, um, they do get to clock on and clock off. Yeah. And um, for all of my work that I do, and I'm not complaining about being, a, being Neil's carer. Yeah. I'm complaining about the way that mm. these supports are set up. Mm. Yeah. But I suppose the thing that for me was the real slap across the face is that I get paid um, $136.50 a fortnight yeah. for, for this work. 
And when um, we had a really rough patch a couple of years ago and um, for the health and wellbeing of the kids and I and Neil, I actually relinquished care for a while, but that's we've since resolved that. Um, but the NDIA overnight um, increased Neil's plan by 190000 a year. So they said to replace what I was providing Neil yeah. um, was worth $190,000. So I struggle on my $136.50 a fortnight. Well, yeah. I don't even notice it, let's be honest. Yeah. But but people are getting paid $190,000 to replace what I do. Yeah. Surely there's a middle ground um, where we can, um, the words that I keep using in my work now is that carers need to be appreciated, acknowledged mm -hmm. and supported. Yeah. If we get those three things, we'll be okay. But at the moment we're not getting any of that. Mm. Yeah. Mm. No, definitely. And certainly um, <clears throat> listening to your podcast and talking through that journey um, of probably that first six or nine months um, of going into the motions of essentially bringing in being a carer on top of all of your life responsibilities and um, <clears throat> naturally quashing, I guess, uh, dreams and other, other thoughts and aspirations to make space for that. Yeah. Um, how did you go in, in that period of time? Well, I drank a lot yeah. <laughs> um, and I was just saying to someone before, I've actually given up drinking because I realised that I was actually making myself quite unwell, that yeah. I wasn't looking after myself and I was using alcohol as a way to slow my brain down because, um, you know, I've definitely become hypervigilant mm -hmm. um, because I always have something to do or to think about or to worry about um, the kids the kids can see that I'm, you know, always wired up. The phone never stops. Yeah. The, you know, the emails never stop. Um, people just ring and launch into conversations about some pretty significant things. Like I had the kids in the car the other day and Neil's surgeon rang and just said, oh, the wound is really serious and it could be related to the lymphoma and I want to operate now. You know, they're pretty heavy things to say yeah. in front of two kids who've already been through quite a bit of trauma. Yeah. OTs ring and just blurt into a really long conversation and I just think, God, it would be great if you'd say, Chris, is this a good time to talk or yeah. is there anybody else mm. around or is there a better time to talk? Mm. Just a little bit of recognition mm -hmm. that I've got a lot going on in my life yeah. um, and I've got a family of people who I'm really worried about and wanting to support. Um, I was admitted to hospital with a suspected heart attack um, because at four in the morning I just woke up suddenly with massive chest pain and um, apparently women of my age, that's what um, heart attacks look like and it appears I was having a stress-induced anxiety attack that woke me up in the middle of the yeah. night. Um, I'm on all sorts of different medication um, for depression and anxiety and blood pressure. Um, you know, I've been told I need to exercise more, but sometimes literally I don't have time to go to the toilet. Mm. And um, so we're trying to, yeah, people talk about the self-care and you need to meditate and mindfulness and this and that. Um, that's great. But there are pressing needs that are yeah. right in front of me on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. and I have to address them. Yeah. yeah. Did I answer your question? You did very well. <laughs> now, so you're... You're a carer for Neil, you're a parent of two wonderful children and you also hold down a role with um, Neighbourhood Houses Victoria. And I thought um, I'd be a celebrant as well just to... And a celebrant as well, <laughs> uh, making time to have important conversations like this and you've come in and met with our team um, as well to share your story. I guess, um, first of all, yeah, that is just phenomenal. Uh, whether or not it's um, appropriate to put that upon you um, to have to carry carry that um, is, is the, I guess, the question there. But your work with Neighbourhood Houses uh, Victoria, can you tell us a little bit about some of the, the programs that, that you're doing to support yep. carers and how they impact? Well, even before I had um, this role, I've always loved Neighbourhood Houses and I've actually acted as president on the committee of my local Neighbourhood House. Yeah. And there are actually more Neighbourhood Houses in Victoria than there are Maccas. So they're <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> They're everywhere and I and they're probably better for you. <laughs> I'd say so. Um, and they offer casual things like book club and um, they've got these chatty cafes which 
can be as informal or as formal as you like where, where you know, half a dozen people meet each week and just sit down and have a cuppa together. Yeah. But what happens from that opportunity to have a cuppa together is you've got uh, a person who works at the neighbourhood house who's skilled and qualified in drawing out conversations from yeah. people and being able to assess and ascertain what it is that they need. And one of the biggest things that I've found um, amongst the carers who I support is social isolation. Yeah. Because we don't have time to hang out with the people that we used to hang out with. Mm. Um, we don't have time to meet new people. So how can we bring, you know, the mountain to Muhammad and um, give people um, some of that support, acknowledgement and respect for mm -hmm. all they do and uh, give them a break but also connect them with other people and potentially open up other opportunities. So the project I'm working on is called, um, that's funded by the Department of Fairness, Families and Housing, is the Carer Employment Support Program. And when I was asked to be part of that, I said to well, two words, one of them is a really rude one, yeah. and said the last thing that carers need is to be pushed into employment. Yeah. But what I do like about it is that it is um, allocating funding to neighbourhood houses to provide free support to carers to do programs within neighbourhood houses that mm -hmm. would give them, I call it giving you your mojo back. Yeah. So getting some confidence back, you know, interacting with other people. It could be doing pre-accredited or accredited training. It could be ending up being a volunteer at your local neighbourhood house. It could be ending up going and getting a job as a CEO of somewhere. Yeah. Um, but that's a pathway. So everyone's going to be on a different part of the pathway. So I love that. I love yeah. that neighbourhood houses, which are a naturally warm, inclusive place to go, yeah. um, can be a place where carers go to. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that. There's quite a bit in that. I just want to make sure if there's any uh, raised hands of anyone that has any questions. I have a question. Oh, okay. So how is that information being disseminated to, to carers? about Through the... Carers Victoria. I know that. <laughs> that wasn't a Dorothy Dixon. Yeah. I know <laughs> about that and my colleague here uh, in the audience is involved in that project. But apart from that, um, staff are... What, spreading the word through So the there. thing is, because it's a pilot project and as, it, as with most government-funded projects, it's extremely underfunded. So we're doing it as a pilot amongst 10 of the 420 neighbourhood houses. But they are spread out statewide so that if people are interested in becoming part of the program, we can link them in with their local neighbourhood house plus one of the neighbourhood houses that provide that program. Um, we're working with all of, the, within those 10 communities, we're working in with existing organisations who support carers in those areas and promotion is mainly through Carers Victoria and Neighbourhood Houses Victoria. Yeah. So what I encourage people to do is become a member of Carers Victoria, yes. become, be, get yourself a Victorian Carers mm -hmm. Card. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that you get through the state government. It gives you the same benefits as the mm -hmm. Seniors Card. I haven't tried it at the pub yet for a counter meal, but and also try um, to see if you're eligible for a companion card because um, what we do is we often go often a couple of times a year we go to the theatre and stay in a posh hotel. So instead of paying for four tickets, we pay for three. Yeah. Now that's a huge, huge saving if you're going to see you know Moulin Rouge or Harry Potter or whatever. So it makes it something fun and that's an activity that the four of us all love yeah. and we can do together. Yeah. Yep. Oh, fantastic. So, but if you're on the, um, if you're a Carers Victoria member, you'll find out about all those sorts of things. Yes, definitely. If you're watching, um, jump on the website, learn more and um, get involved. Mm. Sam. Oh, no. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm you're okay. I'm sorry. I you said a lot and I'm very tired now. Um, um, I just wanted to, yeah, with yourself, I guess it's a phenomenal story. Um, I've, I've had a bit of insight into this before, but literally just being thrust at the age of 11 into instantly becoming a carer for your dad. And I know through hearing your story, that's not passive. That's quite a, a, an active role that you play. Um, can you share with us what that, that journey has been like of what you're comfortable sharing? From from start to finish or Whatever just what like I do? What you would like to share today, yeah. Okay, Yeah. sit back. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, it's been said a few times already, but 2017 came along. 
I'm out playing with uh, my, my friends. I think I was playing a game on my phone. Yeah. And I just hear mum just go, your dad's in bed throwing up. Mm. And I was like, how much did he drink today? And, <laughs> you know, I just assumed he was being an idiot. Two days go by and he's still in bed and we were getting a little worried. So he we decided that him and I should go home and that mum and my little sister would stay there and just finish up. Mm-hmm. And so I'm dad's driving me home, which looking back, probably not an intelligent idea as if anything had happened. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> but, um, we get home a few days of being there. I'm just, you know, worried about my dad, but there's nothing too major. And then I get told, uh, to go into the hospital and say bye. Mm. And just told that, that's the last time I'm ever going to see him. He gets put into an induced coma for, a, it's three weeks. Yep. Sorry, it's, it's all a blur. There was a lot that yeah, happened. There was yeah. a few uh, inaccuracies in the story, but that's okay. You were what? 11 at the time. How could we? Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying what I remember. Yeah, yeah sure. But, um, you know, three, three weeks and mum being told how he's going to die. And some idiot had said to me, that because dad was most likely going to die or he's going to be like this for a while, that I have to be the man of the house now and, you know, step up and look after everyone. And that had such an effect on me that for about two and a half years, I slept with a cricket bat beside my bed. I had nightmares, a lot of just people breaking into our house. I was terrified of any car that went past our driveway and I'd always go out to see if anything was happening. And there was even a night where mum had said something had happened and I had just gone out and was standing at the fence with a cricket bat waiting to see if someone was going to come and hurt us. And so that had a lot of an effect on me. I know, crazy. Mm. But, and that's only a bit of the story then we move into recent times where dad's finally moved back home. We have gotten a lot of stuff built that's able to take care of him, but it's not nearly enough. And if there's any major thing that I've learned, it's that people don't really care about carers. Mm. <laughs> like, I, it sounds very, very bad. There's a lot of incredible people out there, such as my fellow pa- panelist and this weird lady. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of people yeah. who just, t- I, they don't ask what I'm doing, how I'm going. Mm. They just say, okay, how, what do you do to take care of your father? Yeah. How are you taking care of him? And what have you given up to be able to dedicate more time to him? Mm. So I'm expected, as well as mum can heavily agree with this and any other carers in the room, you're expected to drop everything and make that person's life your life. And you're expected to become an inhuman, just, you know, you know just butler. Just, <laughs> oh, you know, they need their pillows changed off. <laughs> yeah. They need their, uh, they need their bum wiped after a, a poo, you're on that. No, you don't do that. Don't I you? said in the past, <laughs> not currently. I'm just making a but point. Even, yeah. But even just yeah. yesterday, Dad wanted, because he was worried that I was go- that he was going into hospital, and he, you know, he doesn't know how long he'll be in there for. Because these things tend to drag on, and he wanted to buy me a Christmas present. And um, in order for him to do that, he needs two people with him. Because we have a travel wheelchair for him that needs two people to lift up, put in the car, take out, put in the ground, lift up, put in the car, take out, put in the ground. Yeah. And so I who and he only has one leg at the moment. Yeah, he's, yeah. he only has the one um, prosthetic leg at the moment, so it's a little difficult for him to do anything, plus, yeah. you know, no, no fingers, so he can't really lift anything. Yeah. yeah. So he needs two people other than himself to be with him four separate times to chair in, chair out, chair in, chair out. And, and you were thrilled about the prospect of going Christmas present shopping, weren't you? Yeah, and then I sat in the car and fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, 
beautiful Christmas shopping, I must say. Yeah. I remember none of it. So yeah, anything else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's um, to misplace the language. Like it's a heroic um, role that you play that you didn't necessarily uh, like. In all instances, you didn't uh, select uh, for yourself. Starting that off with you know the horrific experience of being thrown as an eleven-year-old that now you're the um, the man of the house. Um, oh, I don't like that. And moving moving on from that experience, but then dad comes home and you move into that that role of being a carer at such a, a young age. Um, I know you mentioned to us previously uh, the difference of who your father is to you and the role. I guess the dynamics of your relationship after mm. he came home. Do you want to share about that? I can absolutely share. When he came home, you know, I think he was hoping everything would go back to normal, but to the rest of the family, completely different person. It was six sites of, of strokes. Mm. I don't really know the full details as, you know, doctors just see me as, you know, a kid who doesn't know anything he's talking about. Mm. <laughs> so, I am thrilled to meet the few doctors who will tell me and treat me like an adult and say, yeah. oh, yeah, this has happened, this has happened, this has happened. We think it's fair that you know as I'm nearly an adult. But what the conclusion I've come to is, is that my dad died in 2017. This is not the same person, but I still love him just as much. Yeah. He's a very different person yeah. and he's become more and more reliant on us. Mm. You know, say 2016, whenever we need wood, he'd pick up the log splitter, go out, cut a few logs, bring them in, and we'd have a nice fire. Fast forward to now. Yeah. Uh, I get a call on my phone whenever I'm doing anything. He just says, hey, I need you to come out here and uh, cut wood. And so I'll go out. Uh, we, we were lucky enough to have gotten a, an automatic log splitter, which and he just sits there and watches. Mm. And so he subconsciously, he has just gotten used to us doing everything for him. For example, even the smallest thing, like yeah. I'll get called and they'll say, I need you to come out here right now, I need your help. Yeah. And I'll ask what it is. And he says, that's not important. Yeah. It shouldn't matter what it is, I want your help. And so I go out and like, okay, what's the big issue? Oh, I can't put my watch on. Yeah. But it's changed the whole the whole Dynamic. dynamic. So yeah. you've you've essentially become a parental carer to your dad. Mm. And You're a also, single parent of three. Yeah. <laughs> but but even Eloise who who was eight when dad got sick, yeah. um, you've really taken on a lot of responsibility for looking out for her and worrying about her and um, you know, I slept with her until last year. Yeah. She had had to have me sleeping with her holding her hand all night because she was just terrified that I was going to leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, these kids are suffering lots of trauma and grief and but but Sam's very much felt that he has to look after her, haven't mm. you? I um and I think she's definitely noticed that yeah. as her it's I get told a lot by my friends oh, they're really jealous of the relationship I have with Aloise because they don't have their, that relationship with the siblings. And they're like, oh, how can I? And I just say, so what you do is, <laughs> so you know your dad, we're going to have to change that. Yeah. <laughs> and they immediately realise yeah. what the question they're asking was and that Trauma, you know, yeah. you build relationships, but you lose a lot of relationships and yeah. it's not really worth it. No. But I'm lucky enough that my sister is somewhat sane and that we've gotten to get a lot closer. Yeah. And whenever something's happening at school, she'll always come and talk to me. Yeah. Whenever something's happening with me, I can go talk to her. And we both just know that whatever we say to each other, no one knows, yeah. not even her. Because whenever Aloise and I will have had a very important talk, you will come in and go, hey, what was that about? <laughs> and I just, yeah. you have no reason to know. She trusted me and there's no reason to break her uh, trust. Yeah. FOMO. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was going to say something else and I've completely forgotten what it was. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. But you've been responsible for giving him medication and mm. that sort of stuff as well. So Medic it's yes. they're pretty big responsibilities. Huge and responsibilities. sometimes, you know, when he, even when he has a carer over yeah. and he's very capable of asking them to do anything and they're paid to do it, I get a call saying, hey, can you come out and do this? And I say, why well, can't insert carer's name here do it? Mm -hmm. And he just goes, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to pressure them <laughs> yeah. into doing their job No, that they're paid. To, you, know, you, you, you see where my issues lie. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I know that's um, challenging. I think each time um, anybody asks you to share that, it's, it, it comes from an emotional space. So yeah. I really appreciate yeah. that. I know there was a question in the audience um, here that somebody had. I wanted to touch on that. So I myself am a young carer and I can completely relate to your story even though our stories are so different. Mm -hmm. So I care for five people in my family. Yeah, so I started at the age of seven with my mum who had mental health challenges um, and then were born my two younger brothers. So one is now 14 and one is seven, um, both with autism and ADHD and other challenges. Um, I have my grandma who has age-related issues as well. And I recently started caring for my grandfather who had a workplace injury. Mm -hmm. So I go to all the appointments and I have yeah. to translate things because my grandma's first language and second language is not English. Yeah. So I have to help with all of that. And it's very interesting to see how life was when I was seven mm -hmm. to now that I'm 20. Yeah. Um, there's so much more that I can do that I understand. And there's a lot of blessings that come with being a carer. But there's also so many challenges. Um, mm. I also, to grieve the life that I did have, mm. um, I wish people, especially the people that I'm caring for, would understand that. You know, I was seven. Yeah. I I'm 20. Um, I, we're very European. So this is just pretty much a normal thing. This is something that's expected, expected upon us. Yeah. Um, and I've met a lot of people who go, Oh, you don't need support. You, <laughs> you don't need services because this yeah. is normal back in Italy. Yeah. But it shouldn't have to be like that. So I thank you guys for coming and speaking mm. today because the more we talk about it, the, the more things that are going to get done. And my hope is for that we are able to share our story without having to explain what a carer is. Mm. Yeah. I just wish people would understand or even if they don't, take the time to understand and ask us how we're doing yeah. rather than just get straight to the point that's all we care about and like you said profit off of it which is really sad mm. um but i just wanted to remind you that you also have to care for yourself so i'm yeah. someone mm -hmm. who's chronically ill and it wasn't until i was at my worst in hospital at 18 years old where i didn't know what was left of my life i didn't know what my life was going to look like. Most people with my illness don't go to school, don't work, don't have a social life, nothing. Mm. I wanted to be that change. I wanted to be someone to speak about it. But I thought if I don't look after myself, yeah. who's going to look after the five people? Who, <laughs> it, it, it is so true. Yeah. Yep. So really thank you guys for coming and sharing mm. your story. And there's mm. so many people like you who just need that little bit of confidence to reach out. Mm. Thank you. You've made my year. <laughs> and thank you so much. I hope yeah. I'm not putting you on the spot by saying this, Naomi, but um, Naomi has, has featured in two of our carer videos now um, yeah. and one of our, our jobs at Carer Gateway, um, not only to provide supports but also to help to raise voices of carers and Naomi's done a fantastic job of doing that, as you just heard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We obviously want to be able to help to raise these voices and raise raise awareness and, and hear these stories because to us it's really important to hear stories. Carers know themselves more than anyone else yeah. can know. Mm -hmm. um, so it is really important to continue doing that and that's something that we, we strive to do. Yeah. When I made the podcast, I really did some soul searching because I didn't want it to come across as um, that... I was making this story that was a tragedy for my husband. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to make it sound like it was all about me yeah. yeah, and that I was wanting the spotlight on me when it was him who was really going through so much. And I've actually had a couple of people say to me, 
you've made this about you. Mm -hmm. And I've had a couple of people say to me, now you know your husband needs looking after. You should be focusing on that Mm -hmm. and doing what you can to support him. But that's a couple of people. The majority of people have thanked me and and said that. Mm -hmm. And I suppose Craig was saying before, why do I make the time to do this? I I just think that this is probably... um, with the experience that I've had on both sides of the industry, mm. that um, I've got a story to share that can yeah. hopefully mm. be of some use, and I'm I'm hoping that it can make some change at a policy level. <clears throat> um, so, and Naomi, you're a legend. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. and um, <laughs> and that's the interesting thing mm. where you have this experience now and the having. Um, the ability to share your story is, um, you know, is one of the most valuable things um, that you can do with the information that you have there for others. I guess um, as a reflection point, because I'm sure somebody else is right now, 11-year-old Sam, what um, what advice would you give having the experience you've had back to 11-year-old Sam? I've been asked this question a lot and I've never actually had a proper answer. Yeah. It's... There's just so many things I would say, but one of the biggest things is that the there is three people yeah. or three things that are going to be your biggest help. Your friends, mm-hmm. your family, and your dogs. Yeah. Because animals just have a way of understanding you, and I love my dogs so much. And we, we got a dog a month before it's all happened and we still have her to this day and she's just the best. Mm. Like, you know, sometimes I wake up and I'll, ha- and I'll just have her head here. Ooh, I am on the microphone. I'll have her head here and she'll just be looking up at me just like she's just saying, good morning, are you okay? Yeah. And then my I'm lucky enough to have, as mum so eloquently says, mm found my tribe yeah. of my best friends who, are all, who all love the same stuff that I do. Yeah. And with all due respect to them, they're all idiots. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why they suit me perfectly. They're all quirky. They're all out there. Special. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, they, they all, and they all know that, you know, I'm not just a carer. I have yeah. a life and I deserve <laughs> respect. Yeah. And they know that I've been through a lot. I will go through a lot more. Mm. And that there's no reason to me having to be just a carer. Mm. Yeah. I should be able to express what I love. Yeah. And I should be able to have a social life, as you said, Naomi. <laughs> Can I intervene there? I hate to because it almost feels sacred what you're saying and I don't want to. But um, (laughs) So Naomi and Sam, what I'm thinking of is I'm stepping back thinking it's only since the 1990s that young carers have been sort of studied as as a cohort or a group with their own 1990s before you were born, was it? Yeah. Mm, Okay. Ancient history. The olden days. The olden days. And so... for the two amazingly articulate, wonderful young carers we've got here, I'm thinking of young carers who don't recognise it yet they're a young carer, yeah. who were struggling and, and Access Economics a couple of years ago tried to give us a, a stat to hang on to. Yeah. And they said if all the young carers across Australia were averaged out, there'd be two in every classroom. Now we say up to the age of 25, so we're yeah. just trying to get a, kind of a picture, but tip of the iceberg, I suppose, for the young carers like you who are so in, um, articulate, as I said, uh, there are a whole bunch who are under the radar and aren't recognised and are struggling and don't have a fabulous mother who discerns some of your needs. And I hope there's someone who plays that role in your life too, Naomi, obviously staff and others yeah. here. And, you know, how do we get the message out to them mm. that um, because we know the trajectory for those unidentified ones is not good. You know, they're disengaged at school, they're disengaged socially. The word care is a completely foreign concept, as you said. They don't recognise what they're doing. 
oh, can we just bottle you up? <laughs> Not as an example because you're yeah. living the life, but to somehow... Maybe not living the life. But no, not living the life. Yeah. Wrong phrase. But living be, a life. Living yeah. a life. Not just for your experience as though you're just a, an example. Um, that's horrible. It's scientific. But to somehow identify with kids who don't know. Yeah, let other other young children actually understand yeah. that this, um, yeah. this isn't a journey that they're the only ones taking. Yes. Um, and I think when we come back into those, um, you know, those themes that we were hitting earlier, um, I think that balance of where responsibility and where your emotions are, you have permission for your emotions mm. to go into places mm. of feeling resentment or, um, you know, frustration or even, you know, a level of um, longingness for the, the life that was ahead of you before this took place. And I think mm. it's probably a good, good point to check in with yourself, Nicholas. Like these, we've covered a lot of challenges that young carers are facing today. Mm. Are there others that you're seeing that um, we want to, bring to light today yeah i think um you know we we sort of spoke about some of the supports that care gateway does in trying to get our young people young carers to engage with school and i guess this potentially could be um posed as a question to sam and naomi um yeah. you know carers victoria did research around uh engagement with school and i guess my question would be around um you know, how do you have time to engage with school and what does that actually look like? Because, you know, I could sit here and talk about the research about how um, young carers are academically uh, on average 1.5 years behind. But, yeah. um, you know, I guess that stat does not translate into people's actual stories. So I think that's something to, to take into consideration because when I heard your story, I kind of thought, where do you find the time to go to school? Mm. Um, so I have to say I really struggled with engagement at school. Um, I often didn't go, but when I did, I mentally wasn't in the classroom or doing work. God knows how I got through high school and passed because I didn't, quite frankly, do anything. Um, I always worried what's going on at home while I am not there. What's going on at the kids' school? Do the teachers know how to support them? And the answer is no. No matter how much awareness we have at the moment, it's not enough. Teachers don't know how to understand students, how to tailor support to students. They just let them go under the rug. And I think I passed due to them feeling bad. Yeah. I didn't pass because <laughs> academically I was able to. I didn't pass because I had support. They literally just said, mm, sorry, Yeah. here you go. Um, I think talking like this is what's going to raise support mm -hmm. because people, even if they don't ever hear the word carer, will mm -hmm. be like, oh, what are they talking about? Oh, how many people do I know that are going through this situation? And like um, Jennifer said, there's at least two in every classroom. Yeah. So there's people around us, but they just don't open up. The reason they don't open up is because there's no support. Yeah. There's judgment. And quite frankly, we're scared for people to see what we see every day. So I think awareness is the biggest thing that we need, especially when it comes to school-aged children. Yeah. As well as myself, I just finished my second year of TAFE and they hardly understood my illness, mm. let alone opening mm. up about my home life as well. Mm. I think it's important for all ages, not just the children, but teachers, professionals, doctors, please someone yes. educate our healthcare system. <laughs> Preaching to the choir. You know, Naomi, if I go to an appointment with Neil and I say that I'm his wife and carer, oh, I get treated one way. If I tell them I'm a speech pathologist, they roll mm. out the red carpet. Mm. So I, I use that. I abuse that because um, if I tell them I'm a health professional, Neil gets a much better service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oftentimes, especially with my grandparents and with COVID happening, they don't let me into appointments. They go, no, you can find out later. My poor grandma doesn't even remember what's happening in the appointment, mm -hmm. let alone 10 minutes after. Mm -hmm. She feels so scared. She doesn't understand what is going on. It's, it's not right at all. And mm. if and if I do go, I can't speak my mind. I can't say anything. They don't talk directly to me either. Mm. Yeah. So I just say it. Whether she understands it or not, I explain it to her later. 
And it shouldn't have to be like that. I say that not. carers are the CEO of a team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we we should be treated that way. Mm -hmm. And so the doctors yeah. report to us. Yeah. <laughs> the doctors should be reporting to us. The support workers should be reporting to us. The support mm -hmm. coordinator should be reporting to I us. Agree. It doesn't happen, but that's that's how I think it should be it, it should be done because we're the one mm -hmm. who's making all of this stuff happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Though yeah. the person who is going through a lot. Us yes. as carers go through a lot. So is the person with needs. Mm. The last thing they need is to hear the bad news and not understand it. Yeah. Mm. We need to be able to explain it to them. We need to be supported as well. So I think a lot needs to be changed, but it starts with awareness. There's yeah. never too much awareness. Mm. There's also a um, that age between 18 and 25 where they are where people are still considered young carers, mm -hmm. but because of the word young, they think that it must mean under 18. Mm -hmm. yes. So the young carers between 18 and 25 don't actually think that they're eligible for support as a young yeah. young carer. Um, so that's something also to take into consideration for people not to to look out for support. Yeah, no, definitely, and we're actually quite fortunate today because we have. Uh, almost an extra panelist in the audience. Um, we have Kyle Hayes from Little Dreamers. Uh, it's a national organization that supports young carers that actually does from four to 25. So it doesn't decide that 18 is the cutoff uh, and recognizes that, that group. Kyle, do you mind me putting you on the spot? Could you share a little bit about uh, what Little Dreamers does and the impact that that has? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as you said, we support young carers right up from four all the way up to 25. Um, and I completely agree with Nick. I think for a lot of young people and a lot of youth services forget about that 18 to 25 mark. Mm -hmm. um, I also grew up as a young carer and um, you know, didn't realize that support still extended up to 25 or what a young carer was or identified with that space as well. And I've had a lot of conversations with people that I went to school with and grew up with that also had that experience. And even now that I'm you know, forming connections with it, you, know, you kind of click over and go, oh, that means you're a young carer as well. Or you grew up as a carer. Um, and looking into you know, our schools program that we do, our Young Carers Project, um, getting out and educating um, and training up our teachers and our education support staff in identifying and supporting young carers. And yeah. you know, halfway through training days, having teachers go, I grew up as a young carer, I cared for my sister. Yeah. Um, and they're not realizing that that was their lived experience as well, or that they even have lived experience um, of growing up as a carer and how that they can then use that in their teaching careers and in their lives to support the students that they have that are going through very similar stories or even just very much very closely similar stories yeah. um, to be able to support them in and out of the classroom as well which is really really exciting yeah no, fantastic and what are some of the, those other activities that take place um i first my first instance of understanding little dreamers made me feel full of hope um and um, positivity in there um what are some of the activities that take place I'm work. really lucky. I am currently a state program coordinator for Little Dreamers and I get to run our school holiday programs, yeah. um, which is our respite programs for our young carers to get out on school holidays and do some of those activities and those things that I think regular young people will take for granted in what they get to do for the school holidays mm -hmm. um, and doing some really exciting things with a group of other peers that are going through caring roles as well. And we get to be able to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then I also get to run our Big Dreamers program, which is our youth leadership and um personal development program for 13 to 18 year old young carers. Um, and we look at a lot of those things about their caring role and what does that look like and how we can support them. But I think the bigger thing about it is what's come up a lot, and I think has underlined a lot of comments that have been made from the panel and the audience today yeah. has been, who are they outside of that caring role? Who, who do they get to identify as outside of that? What does it look like going through school or after school? Um, and how can we look at their caring role and support them as young carers, but also who can we, how can we help them as young people yeah. and as human beings um, and support their growth and their leadership skills and their personal development outside of their caring role as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I'll stay energetic about the work that you do uh, moving forward. Uh, it's very easy for us to run out of uh, time. I feel like we could sit here all day and have, have this conversation. I think, you know, one of those things to recap there, there's two points of recognition that um, really need to be um, highlighted here it's the recognition of carers and what they really do and what they go through um, emotionally physically mentally everything that, that goes with that but there's also the recognition that 
once you become a carer, you are not just a carer, you are a person um, and you shouldn't feel guilty um, expecting um, to have life and ambition and support um, and be respected for what you do, but also be respected to, for being a carer, being part of, of who you are. Um, and with that, I'd like to, uh, I guess, bring today's uh, session to a close. Um, I just really, from the bottom of my heart, would like to thank you. Jennifer, Christine, Sam, Nicholas, um, you've been phenomenal in sharing deep uh, stories and, and touching on some hard, hard hitting points there um, for our audience. And thank you so much. I, I didn't expect such a heartfelt story to come out um, uh, from, from an audience point of view, but I, I see there's just immense value in us being able to share this story out um, to a much wider audience and, and build that recognition of who carers are and what they deserve and what they need. So I'd like to thank everybody here today uh, for coming together and being part of such an important conversation. And I'd like to say, stay tuned for the next episode of Chatability. So thank you so much to everybody.